Okay, folks, we are now into the final straight. And for me, always the sign of a successful conference is that you can actually keep people's bums on seats for the whole of the day, which we have done extremely successfully today. So I'm so delighted to see everybody here, and particularly for you to be here to hear the address of our outgoing deputy leader, the wonderful Claire Bailey, uh, you, who is going to address us in that capacity for the last time. And without further ado, I'll ask Claire up to the podium. Thank you very much. Um, yep, I stand here addressing you for the last time as the Deputy Leader of the Green Party in Northern Ireland. And it's been an absolute honour and a privilege, but most of all a pleasure to have been the deputy leader, to have been given the support and the endorsement from yourselves as membership, um, and to watch this party grow over the past couple of years. I think it's been stunning. Um, I suppose the perfect opportunity to say thanks to Stephen. Um, Stephen has always been the voice of reason. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been an absolute pleasure to work alongside you um, and to learn from you, and I thank you for all the support as well. But um, I joined the Green Party in Northern <coughs> Ireland. I don't think it was an easy decision for me to decide to join and sign up and be public with the party in Northern Ireland because I'm not a Catholic and I'm not a Protestant. I'm not a nationalist and I'm not a unionist. The cross-community element doesn't fit very well with me either because I feel that it embeds a notion and a sense of the other. But I am a woman, and it is as a woman that I experience life. It is as a woman that I am identified and treated by society. And that brings barriers, barriers to opportunity and barriers to ambition. But I felt that the Green Party wouldn't have these barriers and didn't have these barriers. But I've seen opportunity in that party, in our party. And these were the major decision-making elements for me joining the party. And I don't think that I've been wrong or disappointed in that, because during my time, since 2011, this party has adopted policies that I'm very, very proud of. We have quotas. We support gender quotas. And I think the most outstanding outworking of that one was that for the first time in 2016, when we stood a raft of candidates, we had, I think we were the first party in Northern Ireland who had a 50-50 a gender balance in terms of male and female candidates. But not only that, we were the first party <coughs> in Northern Ireland to have included their 1L, 1G, 1B, and the island of Ireland's first ever openly trans candidate. And that's something to be very proud of. We also do our best to take a gendered lens on policy making and policy decisions. And I think that perhaps the most current of that would be seen through economic sanctions, such as the two-child tax credit. So scrap the cap, is what we would say. But I'm also incredibly proud and honored and delighted that we also stand up and support the policy to decriminalise abortion in Northern Ireland. I think we were probably the most vocal to step up to this issue, and I see it as a very central issue for women. It is the most politicised piece of healthcare in the world, and everybody should be speaking out against it. But I'd like to take this opportunity to also say that today, in Dublin, not only are the Irish Greens but so many activist groups from Northern Ireland, like Alliance for Choice, march in the streets of Dublin in their thousands to demand a repeal of the Eighth Amendment. So let's give them a big shout out. They're demanding free safety. <laughs> and it's great to see a few Trust Women t-shirts in the audience. <laughs> 
But these are all very important issues. They're important to me as an individual, but they're also very important in bringing about the successful election of South Belfast First Ever Green MLA in 2016. I was full of hope back in 2016 by getting elected. I had a plan, I had work, I had stuff that I wanted to see done. I chose to be on, I chose to put myself forward for the Justice Committee and was delighted when I got a place there because these are all justice issues and we are a party of social justice. But within a matter of months, we're now in this stalemate. The house came down and we now have a standoff between two parties. We have Sinn Féin and their mantra of the equality agenda and the full implementation of previous deals. But in their equality agenda, they still don't stand up for women. We have the DUP refusing to make any concessions. We need to reform the petition of concern. They make no moves on trying to implement a mechanism for ministerial accountability at the assembly. And I could go on. Instead, what we get from them is the rhetoric of cultural supremacy and cultural war. And all this does nothing to further progress politics in Northern Ireland. This entrenches people and instills the fear of old. And it's relevant in South Belfast because South Belfast is perhaps the most diverse, I'm sorry, removed perhaps, South Belfast is the most diverse <laughs> constituency that Northern Ireland has to offer. It is a microcosm of Northern Ireland as a whole. But that's not to be confused with the notion that it's integrated because it's not. We still have the same problems as everywhere else. And this summer alone, in South Belfast, we've seen the bonfires getting bigger. We've seen residents put in danger. We've had 30 apartments in Victoria Place damaged in the aftermath of a bonfire. And the residents left to pick up the pieces and demand that statutory agents step up and help them all by themselves. This was just weeks after we all watched in horror the Grenfell disaster unfold in our TVs. And this bonfire was on land owned by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive, rented to Belfast City Council. Belfast City Council funded the fun day for families around the bonfire, but completely ignored and took no action against the fire service health and safety advice. If that advice had been taken, that bonfire should have been moved almost to the grounds of Belfast City Hall itself, rather than being left to burn the apartments in Victoria Place. But that would never happen. We've also seen at the start of the summer, no action taken by any statutory authorities when UVF flags went up in a shared housing development in Global Crescent and Cantrell Close. Despite residents saying that they felt so fearful and intimidated, nothing was done there. As I speak to you, there are families packing up and leaving their homes after being advised by the PSNI that they could not guarantee their safety. Four Catholic families now being left homeless. And that's all in South Belfast. So I do want to put a call out to say that we stand with those families that we stand against sectarian hatred. And all this, again, in a purpose-built, shared housing development under the executive-approved, together building United Communities strategy. Where in that strategy did we see the mitigation measures to deal with these issues as they arise? Where did we give the explicit consent for the police to step in when hate crimes are happening. We don't. So four families being made homeless this week through sectarian intimidation in South Belfast. So there's much to do. But I'm delighted that I don't do this alone. I do this with the support of a phenomenal bunch of committed South Belfast activists. And it's that team who got me elected and I need to give them their dues. Malachi O'Hara, for one, who's not here with us today, 
but has been an absolute inspiration and has stuck with me and has been fantastic. And I wish him well in the coming years. To Chloe and Anya, who haven't left my side, thank you. But Chloe's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> She's now an international drugs trader. <laughs> 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 But also to our members, Brian Smith in particular, to Peter Ryan, who've all made the office their home, who call all the time, who keep up with what's going on and who help out. I can't name everybody, but Anthony Flynn, Simon Lee, thank you for always being there, for bringing your energy and being a constant source of inspiration. And I want to give a special shout out to Hannah George, Hannah keeps herself very quiet, goes below the radar, but Hannah does so much and rarely gets a shout out. So Hannah, you're amazing. Thank you for everything that you do all the time. But there's many others outside of this party who also hold me up, support me, give me strength and inspiration. And one in particular that needs a mention today because I am absolutely over the moon that Sophie Long has stepped out of those shadows and has stepped into the Green Party and she's here today as a Green Party member. So I'm thrilled, I'm excited and I'm looking forward to working with you in the coming days and years. But all this has been what has convinced me that the time is right to step aside as the Deputy Leader. We've seen an incredible member surge. I joined in 2011. This is 2017. And when I first joined this party, we had a couple of hundred members across Northern Ireland. Now, today, South Belfast alone has more members than when I first joined this party. I think that's phenomenal. I think that's exciting. And this is the reason that I want to give everything back, as much as I can, back to everybody who stood by me. I want to be. Belfast centric. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> A wee bit. <laughs> but to, to be the deputy leader of this party, I have to give equal time and attention right across the constituencies. But I want to see that we build a strong foundation. I want to see the talent, the resource, the commitment, the integrity, and most of all, the capability of the membership in South Belfast brought forward, encouraged and supported as much as possible. Because within this group, we have so much. Within Belfast, we have so much. We have one councillor, Georgina Milne, on Belfast City Council. We need to do everything to get behind her and make that a less onerous task because you're not alone. So I want to develop a strong team who will want to work with me as the MLA and us as South Belfast. I want to build good, strong representatives throughout the South Belfast constituency. I want them to be seen. I want them to be a force going forward into the 2019 council elections. Goodness knows at this rate, could be the only elected reps representing us. So they need to be a strong team and they need to be on message and they need to work together. And I see this right throughout our membership. It's not just South Belfast. And I want to do as much as possible to try and build that strategy that can be implemented in other areas. We have many people in this party who can take on the role of deputy leader, who can support Stephen in his role as leader who can step up and be capable and coherent and strong in that role. And I look forward to getting behind them. So I just want to leave you today with just one simple phrase, that I might not be your deputy leader when I close this book, but I'm not going away, you know. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Claire, uh, for, for your kind words and for all your work. Um, and more of that, that later. If a week is a long time in politics, the past year in Northern Ireland has felt like a political lifetime. At our last AGM, we were in celebratory mood. Claire and I had relatively recently just been elected and re-elected. Um, we gained our second MLA, having ran what was our largest ever assembly election campaign and indeed achieved our highest ever assembly vote. Since then, we've had the challenge of two more elections and we're still standing strong. The reduction to five seat constituencies was supposed to be to the detriment of our party and, and all analysts, I'm not sure if Alan was included, but I, I suspect he may have been, um, predicted that we would lose the seat in South Belfast. That was the story, but we wrote our own script. The challenge was even greater to retain the Sioux seats, but not only did we achieve that and keep in what we had, but actually in a smaller assembly, we had increased the influence of the Green Party in Northern Ireland. And that was thanks to the efforts, as Claire has pointed out, to many in this room who got involved in our campaign and anyone who was here for my session about how you can get involved in an election. You'll have heard the importance we as candidates place in canvassers and volunteers and how vital you are to our campaign. We were united in cause and lest we forget, in South Belfast we picked Pip to the post some significant rivals, not least the now sitting South Belfast MP. But a great team needs a great candidate. And as much as we value your efforts, I do believe there was only one woman who could have taken that seat in South Belfast for the Green Party, and that was Claire Bailey. She and we had little time to rest in our laurels, um, having Claire's case retained the seat in South Belfast um, before we were straight in to a Westminster election. And this was our third election in just over a year. And we saw the strain that made financially, emotionally, mentally. But whilst other parties were contracting, some were standing, one or two token candidates, we were still able to stand the most candidates we'd ever stood in a Westminster election and achieve our highest ever vote. And while all our parties are selling off the family silver, we're actually in as strong a financial position as a party that we've ever been in. And that is because of the continuing growth in our membership. But it's also because of something that is not really very sexy in politics and not maybe that associated with the Green Party. We've done so because of sound financial planning. <laughs> it's not the story that people want to believe about the Green Party. Um, I'm sure the, the, the magic money tree accusation has been thrown at us at times. But we've shown we can do it. We're not paying off our debts. But we don't have any assets to sell off. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but we wouldn't get ourselves in that situation because we know how to plan, we know how to budget, um, and unlike other parties that I'll come to, we can be trusted to manage a budget. <laughs> and in that regard, I pay tribute to our outgoing treasurer, Luke Robinson. I don't think I've seen Luke today, so I'm, I'm sorry he's not here to hear this, but uh, being leader of this party is a genuine privilege, but you do have to rely heavily on the support of volunteers Luke has been a steady hand throughout his time as treasurer, keeping track of the finances, making sure we meet the various legal obligations uh, we're required to. Um, but importantly, he's been a pleasure to work with. I began a bit like I was saying during my session earlier. If you don't enjoy this, you're not going to keep doing it. And that applies for me as, as, as much as anyone else. Luke has been a pleasure to work with. Um, he's served well me. He served the executive committee and the wider membership, and I'd like to thank him. I mentioned the growth in membership 
And whilst that's actually a boon for a treasurer and probably been a privilege for Luke, it's quite a challenge for our membership secretary. And as well as having administered the growth in membership, I think Tanya Jones has done much more. She's enabled that growth and made it sustainable. Again, it, it, it's not always very interesting to talk about systems, but the systems Tanya has put in place really has uh, laid the foundations for our growth going forward. Sometimes the work that's unseen and unsexy is the most valuable, and no one deserves more credit for the green surge than Tanya Jones. So thank you, Tanya. <laughs>
Much was made of the fact that this was the first time Sinn Féin had ever taken the finance ministry of their first pick. And I have to wonder how long did they have this planned. Because it was, in Northern Ireland politics, momentous. What was more momentous was that for the first time in Northern Ireland, we were left without any budget whatsoever. So yes, I support an Irish Language Act, and if need be, I will stand in photographs with whoever else does. The Green Party has supported Indigenous languages all across Europe, often done so where it's not contentious at all. But why would we change our policy here? We believe in it. it's important, and it's not about who is proposing an Irish Language Act. It's about what, it's about what the issue is, and we stand by our principles. But let me be clear, I do not support Sinn Féin in bringing this country to its knees. It is rare that you'll hear me quoting Arlene Foster. <laughs> um, but as with RHI, I do believe the Irish Language Act has become the excuse and not the reason that we have no government in Northern Ireland. And don't get me wrong, I don't disregard the history of what has led us to this point in our politics. The abuse of petition of concern by the DUP was nothing short of a disgrace, was nothing short than undemocratic. Whether it's marriage equality, whether it's the Irish Language Act, whether it's the Bill of Rights, whatever the issue, the use and abuse of petition of concern and the blocking mechanism has done harm to politics in Northern Ireland. But if you take each of those issues, marriage equality, we know we've campaigned for it, we've made it happen, now has a majority of MLA support. The same is true, I believe, of Bill of Rights and the Irish Language Act. And I believe if we're really serious about progressing these issues, a deal could be done tomorrow. And if we don't reform petition of concern, we might get those three things agreed. But it'll, what's the next issue that the DUP and others who support them in their cause choose to block? If we don't change the fundamental issues, the fundamental structures of the Assembly, we cannot make progress in the long term. And that's why I believe that Sinn Féin are not genuine in this talks process. It's why I believe that they have come to the decision it's not in their interests to be in the Assembly and to see it working. Because in the talks, when you raise the issue of petition of concern, it is not a priority. Either one, because as I've said, they don't want to go back in, or two, they don't want to let go of that power of being able to block things they don't like. And whilst we have a politics based on mutual veto, we won't make progress. But of course, petition of the concern is not an issue that's going to bring people onto the streets. It does not tap into the historical divisions of Northern Irish society. In other words, it does not fit in to the Sinn Féin divide and conquer strategy. And most galling to see has been their crocodile tears over Brexit. From a party that couldn't even muster a campaign against Brexit, and now one that chooses not to take power when the issue of the border is actually top of the agenda. While the status of the Irish border dominates the Brexit negotiations, Northern Ireland is left rudderless and powerless. The Green Party is in a unique position as a member of the European Greens with 51 MEPs in our group in Parliament <coughs> to feed into that discussion. Uh, the parliamentary group has been in touch with us and indeed our colleagues in the South about the border and we are feeding in into those discussions and we are having an input um, including in papers that were submitted to Michelle Barnier and discussions that took place on the back of those. The border is an intractable issue 
And I remember in the assembly raising it with Arlene Foster when she was first minister. And we'd heard the mantra, no hard border, I think at this stage, the Irish government had said no hard border, the UK government had said no hard border, even the DUP was saying no hard border, and everyone was agreed and that was great. And we were told during the election campaign, or the referendum campaign, everyone's agreed, no hard border. Anyone who raises an issue is scaremongering. But no hard border is meaningful as Brexit, Brexit means Brexit. It tells us nothing. It's an intention. It's one I support, but it's an intention and no more until we get some detail as to what no hard border actually means. Then it is meaningless as a phrase. And I suppose the irony being that now as Europe seems to be coalescing against around the idea of the political border maybe remaining on the island of Ireland, but the trade border move into Irish, the Irish Sea. As the Unionists, as the DUP, it is Arlene Foster who now fear that their beloved Union is going to be divided by Brexit. And whilst I want to see the best deal for Northern Ireland, I do have some sympathy with Barnier when he says, you propose this, you find a solution. So to Arlene Foster and to the DUP, who were so keen in Brexit that took out a half a million pound ad in London. <laughs> you were so keen, well now tell us how it works. You were so keen you told us it would work. You told us in fact we'd be better off. Show us how. How do we solve this issue of the border in a way that's acceptable, not just to unions, but to us all? For me the reality is if we leave the customs union, there are three simple options. We have a hard border in the island, Everyone said they don't want it. We have a hard border between the two islands. I imagine most of us wouldn't want it, and unions certainly won't. Or we have a hard border around these islands, which I don't think Europe or Ireland <coughs> would accept. And the only conclusion I can come to is either we ditch Brexit altogether, and of course we are a party for Remain, or we secure a deal that looks so much like Remain as to make no difference. And actually, if you listen to Theresa May's Florence speech and Davis, David Davis since, I think that's the conclusion that the UK government are coming to because they have now committed to meet the financial commitments. They've committed to pay in regard to the European courts that they were so keen to extricate themselves from. And they've now said, well, for a transition period, maybe we should remain within the single market. It's all starting to sound very much like a soft Brexit. Indeed, it's starting to sound like the come 2019. Very little actually will be different. And the one thing I can't help but laugh at, we, we, we hear talk of the two year transition period. And yet the Turkey farmers who voted for no Christmas are now saying we need a five year transition. The advocates for Brexit are now starting to fall one by one. People are increasingly seeing that they may have voted for their hearts for something they believed in, but in reality, it makes no practical sense. But one thing that will be different in 2019 is what will happen in May 2019. The European elections will take place, and we as a party certainly in Northern Ireland, will not be fighting them. And indeed, across the UK, there'll be no elections taking place. We are entering a period of taxation without representation, because as I say, we're committed to meeting our financial commitments. We will pay but have no say, and rather than taking back control, we will be ceding power. That will be the legacy of Brexit. But there is another way. Rather than less democracy, we should have more. Any deal between the EU and the UK government must be brought back to the people through referendum. Only then can we make an informed choice as to whether or not we leave the EU and do so in full knowledge of all the terms. The possibility of changing your mind is not anti-democratic. 
It is the essence of participative, deliberative democracy. Northern Ireland and Scotland already voted to remain. And I do see, as I said, one by one, the arguments of the Brexiteers falling away. And I would hope in such a referendum that England and Wales would join us in voting to remain. <coughs> I started with discussing this recent period of elections and in closing, it's been a, really has been a, a time of elections. It, it, it's hard not uh, to reflect further. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a, a story from, from one of the recent election campaigns. I may get right which one, but they, they, they start to blend into one. I think it was the last Saturday of the second assembly election campaign in March. Um, Clerk can correct me if I'm wrong. And I, I, I did what's become a, a tradition. I did my tour of of the constituencies for canvassing. And I witnessed something in South Belfast that I'd, I'd never witnessed um, in all my time in the Green Party. And I've been campaigning elections now for, for nearly 15 years. I know you wouldn't know it to look at me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I came to South Belfast and we had the leader of the Irish Greens, Eamon Ryan. We had the leader of the Scottish Greens, Patrick Harvey. And we'd more people on the streets of South Belfast than used to be members of the Green Party as a whole. It really was a sight to see. And such is, is the love for Clare Bailey that we even had members from the far-flung reaches of Bangor County down. <laughs> um, they, they were suddenly chastised for, for leaving my constituency. But, uh, but I, I think it's true. And I... I, I we, we, we miss a lesson if we fail to learn from what Clara Bailey has done. She has built the Green Vote and the Green Constituency Group in South Belfast virtually from scratch. As I said earlier, no one else could have done it. This wasn't simply a fact of, well, it's Liberal South Belfast, they came out and voted Green, of course they did. This was hard work, campaigning, effort, dedication, time, nights, you, the whole lot. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's not easy to win an election. It's certainly not easy to win an election as a Green. Clare has put in that time, put in that commitment, um, and delivered it um, in South Belfast. And I think it's borne out by the fact we, we do things ours about facing the Green Party sometimes, by the fact that we don't yet have a councillor in South Belfast, but we have an MLA. Um, it's not how things are normally done in politics. But I think it's because we did built we built around a person, we built around a personality, um, and it was the force of personality that that won us that seat, um, and indeed retained it in increasingly difficult circumstances. So it's it's no it's no secret that we plan to build further in South Belfast. We plan to take these council seats. I don't think I'm giving any of our rivals any inside track in saying that. But anybody who plans to put themselves forward and underestimates what Claire Bailey has done will fail to get elected because it takes all those things. It takes the networking. It takes the rain at nights out in the rain. It takes anything. Well, maybe not in South Belfast, what I've had to do, canvassing and knocking doors on your own. Um, but it takes every inch of your energy, every ounce of your strength um, to, to get elected. Um, and again... <laughs> To, to get re-elected. So when, when Claire suggested to me that she might not stand for re-election of deputy leader, I, I, I asked her to reconsider. But as she explained it to me, I did understand. Because I know the privilege of leadership. But I also know the burden as well. And I know the commitment that Claire has given to her constituents and to her constituency group and her determination to build a party in South Belfast um, and as Bel in Belfast as a whole. And I think when I realised that, I realised that this was the right thing, not just for Claire, but for this party. I want to thank Claire for her service. I know we have throughout today. But I want to formally thank her for her service as Deputy Leader. She has been 
phenomenal. But I know she'll continue to inspire us as Green MLA for South Belfast. Thank you, Claire. But while some parties have more seats than talent, <laughs> we have more talent than seats. And what Claire has recognised in that stepping down, she does give the opportunity for someone else to bring that talent to the fore. And whichever candidate is successful tomorrow, I look forward to working them with them. I don't feel, I feel like it's a, a wedding. I don't feel like I'm losing Claire. She <laughs> continues as South Belfast Green MLA. But I do feel we will be getting a new member of our growing team. Conference today has been a genuine pleasure. I really have enjoyed it as much as anything else, not having to sit at the top table the whole day as I have in previous years. Um, but I've really enjoyed it. Um, it is important to recognise the work that goes into pulling off a day like this. Um, I want to thank in particular Sinead McIver. Um, it's her first conference and she's done a phenomenal job. I think she proves the, the adage that if you want something done, ask a busy person. And if you can find a busy person who's a woman that's seven months pregnant, well, all the better. Um, because she really has it, it excelled herself. I want to thank Louise, Hannah and Rowan who've helped. And if I've forgotten anyone else in that regard, um, thank you for the work you've put in. As I say, these things don't happen by accident. But I want to thank you all for your recent commitment over the election campaigns. Again, another South Belfast story. But when Claire and I were trying to work out what the hell we did in the event of this snap uh, assembly election, I think it was this time, South Belfast were already out knocking doors <laughs> before Claire could even catch up. And I think that uh, does show the dedication and commitment that's in this room. And whilst the future of politics in Northern Ireland is uncertain. One thing that is clear is the dedication and commitment to the people in this room, not just to grow in the Green Party, but to make in Northern Ireland a better place. Thank you. thankfully was that this was a conference that he didn't have to sit at the front for the entire time. <laughs> all I can say is how thankful I am and that you should be that all the things I was going to say in my closing remarks, Stephen has already <laughs> said for me, <laughs> including all the thank yous, particularly to the staff of GPNI for the work. I mean, I know myself personally what a conference takes to put together. This has been slick. It has been professional. You have done us proud. Thank you so much indeed. I'd like also to say thank you to Jenny Muir who has co-chaired with me today in that she did uh, the um, a presentation of the different conversations and that was absolutely brilliant and I've forgotten the words because I'm now flummoxed and I want to go home and I'm tired <laughs> but uh, I handled it so beautifully and I think that that was you know to get that many people saying what you want them to say or what they have to say takes real skills so thank you very much Jenny. <laughs> And just to say thank you all for attending. I have been so pleased and actually happy to hear the buzz in the room when people were out having a conversation, the energy that was there, the continued sort of commitment and passion and the friendliness and people getting all together and that level of communication and positive communication really lifts your spirit and I think reflects who we are as a party. And one thing I would just like to say in closing, I think that while it has been a celebration today of our journey so far, 
and also, I suppose, an anticipation of our journey into the future and what we can do and how we can change politics in Northern Ireland. I think it has also been sobering listening. Sobering listening for the problems that we still continue to face, that we've heard from the panel and also from Ellen, about how we as a society still, on a whole, have no comprehension or idea of what human rights are, of what social justice is, and how we, many times, are the lone voice crying in what appears to be a wilderness. But we are that lone voice. And when we look around and we look at the growth of the party, we realise that if as individuals we may feel alone, we're not. We are there to have a coherent and a cohesive voice for those who are less privileged, for those who are disadvantaged. And that isn't just for us as a party together. Yes, we do have power and we have weight in numbers and we have wonderful MLAs and councillors who are figureheads who can channel our vision to the wider population. But each one of us in this room has a responsibility. We have a responsibility to get involved in local advocacy, to be looking at all of those liberation groups, all of those things that we heard today, where we actually can be advocates for those who are our allies in social justice. And I really would encourage you each to do that, that you do have a voice, that even though we are part of a party, we are also individuals and we have individual responsibility to lead by example and to lead by example on behalf of the Green Party in whatever element of work or whatever arena we find ourselves in. And so I would send you off with that thought, hopefully to come back or bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to go through it all again tomorrow for the AGM. <laughs> and that you would all be good children for me and to do the policy thing with the wonderful professionalism and calm that we have today. Perhaps maybe with not quite so much alacrity, we will have a little bit more time to discuss things and to have a, a, a good debate about some really important technical issues tomorrow. But thank you so much for attending. Thank you for staying and safe journey home.